In the early 19th century, when America consisted of only 13 states, Americans lived only in the eastern part of the continent and had never even seen the West. This fact of the undiscoveredness of his homeland was a source of anxiety to Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, who believed that the United States should extend across the entire continent. On the 18th of January, 1803, he addresses a secret message to Congress to obtain $2,500 for an expedition to the West. The aim is to reach the Pacific Ocean. The secrecy was due to one simple fact. At the time, the continent was not ruled solely by Americans. Parts were claimed by the British, Spanish and French. And, of course, there were originally many Native American tribes living there. There was therefore concern that other countries would be dismayed at the news of their rivals' reconnaissance or research expedition. As a result, in 1804, the crucial for American history Lewis and Clark expedition begins, lasting about two years. The 8,000-mile journey gave the U.S. government its first look at the vast lands west of the Mississippi River. Thomas Jefferson commissioned Lewis and Clark to search for new trade routes, to establish relations with Western American Indian tribes, and to report on the geography, geology, astronomy, zoology, botany, and climate of the West. In the end, this expedition not only brought valuable scientific and geographical knowledge, such as 178 previously unknown plant species and 122 unknown animals, all this gave a boost to economic relations, created detailed maps, literally opened the way for American settlers and traders. Well, let's not forget the military. Their detailed report enabled the government to set priorities for further exploration and, eventually, the settlement of the West. The military, in the form of army forts, moved westwards to protect critical transport hubs and resource staging areas. Very soon, 40 years from then, when the West has stabilized to some extent, the government, in collaboration with industrialists, will sponsor the building of railways that will stretch across the continent, connecting East and West. And then in 1848, they find gold in California. All this was hard to imagine in the early 1800s, but 40 years later, it is clear to everyone what a leap in development the Lewis Clark expedition has brought. But don't be discouraged that we won't experience the ecstasy of exploratory discovery, since the whole Earth has already been explored up and down. Very soon, discoveries will be made on the Moon. Everything is clear with the asteroid Psyche that we talked about in the last video. It's a huge lump of metal that can be picked with a pickaxe and used for production on Earth. The only problem is that it's a shitload of miles away and it takes six years to get there. But remember what I said at the end of the last video? Yes, Psyche specifically is a far horizon event, but there are plenty of objects in space that could be useful to us on Earth. And these objects, though not as immensely rich, are playing closer. Take the moon, for example. Now tell me, why do we need the moon? Do they expect to find gold there, like in California? Or do they want to build a railway there? Write your version in the comments right now. After all, you do realize that I didn't just make a video for nothing. It's likely that someone will be going to the moon soon, and not just to put their country's flag there and get it on tape. Like the Lewis and Clark expedition, America plans to explore, or if you like, scout the previously unreachable South Pole of the moon. This will happen soon, in just two years, and it is only 400,000 kilometers away, not half a billion as far as Psyche. 
So, why on Earth would they want this piece of cheese in space? Are you ready to see something that will change the way you see the world? Knowledge that will take humanity to a new level and lead not just to another technological revolution, but to a new era. And here it is. Well, it's not as epic as you'd expect. But what did you think? You're on the internet. It's all about scamming people. But what you actually see is the atomic structure of helium-3, not to be confused with ordinary helium. The hero of our story is missing a single neutron. So this seemingly harmless fact leads to helium-3 having the chance to become a new, powerful, radiation-free source of thermonuclear energy. In fact, this isotope of helium has been studied for about a hundred years and everyone prophesizes a new energy revolution for it. But here's the problem. On Earth, this isotope is almost non-existent. Well, actually it is there, but like all interesting things, it is in the center of the Earth, in our case. In the core, to be precise, which is hard to reach. In this case, it's easier to go to the moon. But where on the moon does this helium-3 come from, you might ask? The thing is, in addition to being a battery for all life, the sun bombs the entire cosmos with ionized particles. The phenomenon is called solar wind, which, by the way, allows us to see the northern lights. Now, this solar bombardment has our story's hero, Helium-3, but our planet's atmosphere carefully protects against ultraviolet light and against Helium-3, as it happens. The moon, though, which has virtually no atmosphere, is bombarded freely with the isotope. Okay, can you give me some exact figures? I don't understand its significance yet. Well, yes and... No. As I said, it's been studied for about a hundred years with all sorts of theories and concepts and predictions. When I was making this video, I found this NASA paper called Lunar Helium-3 and Fusion Power. It was released in 1988. You could say it's already a 200-page historical document. Already at that time, they were trying to assess the prospects for mining the isotope from the lunar regolith. Right now, estimates are roughly like this. 100 kilograms of helium-3 is potentially enough to fuel a 1,000 megawatt power plant for a year. Such a power plant could power a city with a million-plus population for a year as well. By comparison, to get a 1,000 megawatts by burning coal, it would require 450 kilograms of coal. Well, except that we would get megawatts per hour. Helium-3 is like a megawatt per year. I'm not sure, though, if you can just multiply 450 kilograms of coal by 8,760 hours to equate these values, but I think you can see how effective Helium-3 seems to be. That said, the moon is expected to have a shitload of it. Remember the story when the Americans landed on the moon in 1969? Well, when there were a bunch of conspiracy theories that it was all staged. So they parked at this Mare Tranquillicate, Mare Tranquillitatis, Mare Tranquillitatis spot. And even there, they expect to encounter a regolith with 5,000 tons of helium, which turns out to be fuel for 100 power plants for 50 years. In other words, 100 million people could be powered by that helium for 50 years. But that was just a specific example. In general, just over a million tons are expected to be found on the moon. And even more of this fuel is expected to be found on other planets. So I never tire of repeating, I wish I had been born a little later. But in all likelihood, at least I'll catch the moon base. Do you know what the problem with all hype technologies and discoveries is? More often than not, the actual application of such technologies will be very different from the description of the bright future of overexcited experts. 
As much as the estimate of the asteroid Psyche of 10 quintillion dollars sounds hyped, in reality we will only get more or less useful information on what to do next in 20 years minimum. And that's assuming everything goes according to plan. It is the same with Helium-3. Yes, the potential is huge, but how much it will cost to produce it, how much the logistics are, and most importantly how to work with it are still huge questions. But there is a treasure on the moon that is much clearer and simpler. We know how to work with it. We know its properties. We have touched it. What's more, we drink it every day. Beer. <coughs> Water. Haven't we got enough water on Earth? We've got enough, but it does not fit the purpose of setting up a refueling base on the moon. Look, this is water. If we split water into hydrogen and oxygen, we get gaseous states that are quite light and have a low density. That is, they take up a lot of space and space constraints in logistics is a major problem. To fix this problem, hydrogen and oxygen are liquefied, that is, turned from a gas into a liquid. Simply put, they cool it down at very serious temperatures. Hydrogen at minus 253 degrees Celsius and oxygen at minus 153. Congratulations, we have obtained rocket fuel which can be fed into the combustion chamber before our rocket takes off. What are the implications for logistics? Now, pay attention. If you can stop at a lunar orbital or lunar base for refueling, you no longer need to take all your fuel with you when taking off from Earth, making your spacecraft much easier and cheaper to launch. And spacecrafts eat fuel like elephants, several tons of fuel per second. In order to have something to compare it with, here is a historical fact. For the 1967 mission to the moon, the Saturn V, which took one small step for man and a giant leap for mankind, contained just under 950,000 gallons of fuel. Converted into tons, that's about 3,586 tons. Clearly, over 60 years they have found room for optimization, but this is for us to understand how much fuel rockets eat up and how much that same fuel adds to the weight. Having said that, you can already guess that launching a rocket from the moon will require less fuel in general than from Earth. I mean, theoretically, a hundred tons of fuel will push a rocket up much higher from the moon than the same amount of fuel will push the same rocket from Earth. After all, not only is the moon six times less gravitational than the Earth, but the cheese ball doesn't even have an atmosphere. To sum up, the idea is this. If a sustainable source of fuel could be created in space, it could greatly reduce the costs and failures of heavy lift launches. Furthermore, the moon could be used as a refueling station for flights to other planets or valuable asteroids, as well as for maintenance station of current vehicles. And I personally cannot imagine the opportunities that could then open up for the human race. It's like predicting what Lewis and Clark would find in the West on their expedition. According to one NASA estimate, 600 million tons of lunar ice could be mined, while other higher estimates suggest a billion tons is possible. Estimates here, estimates there. When are we going to fly there and who? Oh man, I really missed that point. Project Artemis starts in 2025, flying, as usual, the Americans. The main objective is to figure out how to extract water. The point is that there are no decorated icebergs that you can simply walk up to with a pickaxe and mine. Water on the moon is found in the form of tiny ice grains mixed with soil, mostly in permanently shaded areas inside craters near the poles. That is, not only is it as uncomfortable as possible, as dark as Malevich's square, but the temperature is also a hell of a lot worse. Minus 233 degrees Celsius. All this makes possible extraction very difficult. 
Certainly, clever people have invented different methods, such as building big towers with concave mirrors at the crater's edges to reflect sunlight into shaded areas and raise the temperature of the working zone to ultra-comfortable minus 53 degrees Celsius. Well, in short, exactly all these theories are to be tested. The landing zones have already been selected. Clearly, they were identifying where the most lunar ice was located, and that's just the South Pole. NASA has already selected 13 sites. And in this non-political video happens... The Sudden Twist! The race for resources has never happened without politics. And now China is planning to land on the moon. And who would have thought they would also land on the South Pole, competing for space with the Americans? And the new round of colonization, which will happen within, well, 15 years, we will see it with our own eyes. The next video will be precisely about the politics in space. You know who to share this video with. We say a huge thank you for the supporters on Patreon. And I'm... The Researcher.